Hello, everyone. So good to see you here. You guys are so far away. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with a, a quick round of introductions. We'll start at the end with you, Maya. Hi, so Maëlle Gavé, I'm the CEO of Techstars. Uh, we are one of the largest pre-seed investors in the world. We have 3,000 companies in portfolio. This year, we're going to do about 600, 650 pre-seed investments. And we do that all around the world, um, across all type of verticals, from agrotech to fintech to edtech, et cetera, et cetera. Jeanine? I'm Janine Stickmeyer, general partner at Overlooked Ventures. We are a $50 million fund investing in historically ignored founders. Prior to this, I was a founder myself for seven years. I bootstrapped a company to acquisition and started my investing career after that. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Renata Quintini. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Renegade Partners, a $100 million early stage fund uh, in the Bay Area. We focus on what we call the super critical stage, which is that moment post product market fit where you're thinking about really growing your team and your organization and building companies that people want to work for. Uh, we invest in software companies. Uh, I've been in venture for 15 years now, uh, and I'm originally from Brazil, was a lawyer a long time ago, so not you're out of central casting what you expect to see as a VC. So very excited to be here and having this talk with you guys. Well, welcome. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, let's, let's start by getting the lay of the land. Janine, would you sort of sketch the situation for us? How are we doing at finding the founders of tomorrow? Yeah, so I think when we talk about finding the founders of tomorrow, what we really need to do is look at the overlooked founders, those who have been historically ignored, because they outperform their peers by 35%, um, but still we're seeing a decline in these numbers um, uh, for venture funding. So I guess Crunchpa uh, Crunchbase just reported that black founders received 1.2% um, of venture capital in the past uh, six months. and. Last year, in 2021 alone, um, women only received 2% of venture capital. So that's, you know, that's what we're seeing. And some of the other uh, people of color and indigenous numbers aren't even reported. We're not a, anything yeah. to add to that? Uh, yeah, so I, um, I'm one of the original founders of an uh, organization called All Raise. Uh, we started in 2018 to really help increase the representation of a female and uh, people of color and other uh, ethnicities in both the funder world and also in the founder world. And on the people that have the ability to write checks, when we started in 2018, about only 9% of the check writers in uh, venture firms, not counting biotech, were female. And we now drove this number to 11%. And we have this goal to let's get to double where we started in, uh, you know, in 10 years. And on the company side, uh, you know, like Janine mentioned, we still have a, a bunch of work to do. We have seen really good evolution in companies that have females as part of the co-founding team. So mixed male and female, but if you look at the female only uh, founding teams, the representation is not that large. And also the amount of capital that they are able to raise does not compare to the male peers. So last year, PitchBook released a report um, along with NVCA, and if you actually look at male-only firms, they raise an average of $5 million, whereas female-only co-founding teams raise an average of $2 million. And this really changes the trajectory of what you can build and what's the type of company you can build and the types of risks that you take. So it's actually very important to look at the earlier stages, and that's why it's awesome to have these two amazing women here today. Mayel, anything to add? Um, I have to say I'm a little tired to be talking for the last. I've been in tech for 15 years plus. I've been running tech stores for one and a half years. And, and I'm a little tired to have to make the case of why we need more women in tech. Um, the reason why at Techstars we invest in so many women, if you, like, if you look at our last three cohorts, uh, so three years of investment, uh, we had on average 30% of our CEO who were women. Um, and we do that because we see in actual numbers yeah. tremendous financial upsides. Uh, investing in women is actually the right thing to do if you're an investor because there's so much talent, so many unbelievable ideas that are only requiring more financing. 
um, I really, really hope that I'm not going to be back here next year and the year after and the year again after to talk about the fact that we should be investing in more women. But I have to say, something tells me that I'm going to be back. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's press on that a little bit. What what's the problem? What's why do we keep having this conversation? What's holding? women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups back? I think it starts with um, the fact that the VC industry in general operates through patterns. And even though VC will tell you that they have their own investment thesis, so you go and talk to them individually, they will tell you that they have a very clear view on what makes them different from everyone else. I've been a founder myself three times. Yeah. I've been fundraising many, many times. And the reality is, in a lot of cases, in the vast, vast majority of cases, it's just they're literally ticking the boxes. And so if you happen to be different, very different, and you don't tick any of these boxes, there is always this unconscious reaction to, oh, I don't know if that's too risky. The VC industry is fundamentally risk adverse, no matter what they tell you. And then the second piece, uh, and this is where Techstars really comes in, is a lot of these underrepresented founders do not have the friends and family to help them with capital. We do that. They don't have necessarily the uh, background, uh, the education specifically focused on becoming an entrepreneur. I mean, my parents didn't talk about balance sheet and fundraising at the dinner table. Um, and they don't have the network, and nobody succeeds alone. Like, if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur, you need to have great talent in your company, amazing board members, a lot of supporters, and the client that go with it, and a lot of underserved founders were not born in conditions where this is given to them, and the VC industry does nothing to correct that. So, Janine, I know that what Mael just said struck a few chords with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talk about As that. As a, a female founder who was building a tech company um, for several years, I also tried to raise capital, had a very difficult time, and saw that a lot of the um, challenges that I faced were the same that all women um, in tech were facing. And that's why I started angel investing in women um, and trying to you know, find ways through um, starting the new fund where we're eliminating some of those um, those you know pattern matching um, techniques, I suppose that you know most VCs are using. So we don't accept warm intros at all. We make you know all founders go through the same way, even if it's you know a family member who wants to um, apply for funding or a friend. Um, and we say that we're the friends and family round you've never had because we know that so many of our overlooked founders and. Um, you know, people who have never raised capital before don't have that opportunity. So I think there's a lot more that we could be doing. And I, I know that programs like Techstars is so wonderful for founders who don't have the network and um, even the resources. And so I, I applaud what you all are doing so much. So. Yeah. And I think that, you know, like everyone in this room can actually have an impact because the funding is just one piece of the puzzle and the bottleneck but also it's the experience and the network, and we all work or we run tech companies. So actually having diverse talent work at tech companies, and not just you know, in some roles and positions, but also at the executive level, at the board level, this is going to increase the profile and going to increase the network and the experience level, and it's just gonna bubble up more people with, with the skills and capabilities and competence to actually excel. So it really takes an ecosystem change, and it's not just the, you know, the fund or this, or that, that one piece is not gonna solve it all, alone. Yeah, so, you know, you, we spoke about women, people of color, what other dimensions of difference do you think about? Janine, you wanna jump in? Yeah, so at Overlooked Ventures, we're, like I said, investing in um, historically ignored founders, and we look at, there's you know, so much that can go into that. And when people apply, they're like, well, I don't, I don't actually know if I'm um, you know, overlooked. And I think that kind of is telling um, because you know, it, uh, we allow people to self-identify as overlooked, but um, it, that, that looks like 
LGBTQ plus um, uh, veterans, and um, you know we're seeing uh, obviously race and gender. Um, there's a lot of other ways that people can be overlooked, um, disabled, and we're you know we're taking in all of these uh, opportunities to invest in in these founders, and then you know giving them um, the network that they never had. So, in an earlier conversation, um, Janine, you mentioned that in order to find these founders of tomorrow, the investing side has to, has to change. We need, we need change on that side to get change on the invested side. How do you make that happen? Mayel, I saw you nod your head. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention about your last question, the other things that we look at is age. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is because I used to be the youngest person in the room when I yeah. became the CEO of a company that wasn't mine. Uh, I'm not anymore. And, and I, I realize how much our industry in tech looks down at people once they pass 40, let alone 50. And by the time you're 60, you better not show up. And we've just, uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, we completed a program uh, with the venture branch of the Melinda Gates Foundation, and the average age was 50 years old uh, in that program. And I had founders at the end of the program coming to me, and I'm not kidding, with uh, tears in their eyes saying, I'm 63, this is the first time in the tech industry that people take me seriously. Yeah. And that to me is breaking my heart, mm -hmm. because these are people who are so much to bring in terms of experience and idea and sometimes connection and everything, and we're not even giving them an opportunity. So sorry, I just had to talk about that. I'm probably so because glad I'm you aging. brought that up because it has come up <laughs> well repeatedly said. in conversations here at Collision for me. The the kind of the the, the sort of double bind of age and and gender. Oh yeah, if you're a woman past 50, yeah, like just not yeah, not going to be any real opportunity for you. So I, I think your question was, how do we change that? Um, apply to tech stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm serious, like there has to be more programs around the world, more investors uh, who really go and talk to these founders and give them a real opportunity. Again, talents and ideas are distributed equally around the world. You just have to find them and help them. Give them this opportunity that they don't have if you're a VC and really work at it. Don't make it just a, a nice speech or a few sentences on your website. Come and talk to us. Like We have a deal flow. We, we do not lead rounds after the companies graduate. We do continue to invest and support them, but we do not lead rounds come and lead this round. Like we have unbelievable founders, black founder, brown founders, female founder, 55 years old founder. Like these are people who need you and who are going to change the world if you believe in them. And, and can I be a little, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also on the limited partner side that invests in venture funds, so much of diversity is also considered double bottom line or triple bottom line along this bucket of impact. And this is actually not furthering the cause because you're here to compete head to head and you only stay successful in this asset class if you're a top performing fund. Doesn't matter the type of investments you make, you need to outperform. So this thing, it's not, it's not charity. No. Mm -hmm. Right? It's actually the opposite of it. It's, it's, um, it's money making, it's, it's yes. greed and, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. And I think one, one axis that we haven't talked about that you know, I wanted to bring up too is the narrative in the media and, and the conversation of what it means to be a female founder and a female-led company and you know, also celebrating the successes and the, and the hardships and the terminology that we use. Like we can frame this as an amazing journey and an opportunity or we can um, sensationalize and, and go for the clicks, right? So, you know, for example, recently Glossier had a CEO change, you know, Emily Weiss, amazing founder, built a tremendous company, amazing cult following. And now this company is at a, a stage where it needs different, and they change CEO and the media talks about it at the end of the girl boss era, mm -hmm. right? And it, 
So many male-led CEO, you know, CEOs go and, they, and the companies go to evolve and the media doesn't frame it this way. So this is an opportunity to actually celebrate the evolutions of companies and like you actually made it to the stage where, you know, the CEO has, um, you know, reached a stage where the company has outgrown the abilities of the CEO and that should be celebrated, mm -hmm. right? Um, not sure. Yeah, and I'd say um, on, on the point about um, how can we change who we're making rich, really. Um, I, you know, as a, a new fund manager, we're receiving LP commitments from anything from, you know, high end net um, worth individuals to banks and other institution um, capital. And we, we really, when we get like a large check-in, we wanna make sure that we're also saving room for women LPs, black LPs, LPs that don't typically get into funds um, like ours. And so that we can also, you know, make sure that we're, we're diversifying not just um, our team, the people that we're investing in, but also those that are, we're making rich. So um, I think that that's also something that, you know, we really need to see because if we continue to make the same people wealthy, they're going to invest in the same people and we're not going to see any change in, in diversity of founders. Well, and to so, that point, we do see some founders have a diversity clause in their term sheet, mm -hmm. right? Saying we want the cap table to be diverse and actually we will choose leads that are either diverse or will support this, uh, this value that we have. So, you know, I wonder if you could get really specific about the kinds of support that you provide to the founders whom you invest in that is different, it's just different than you would find at, from, you know, the guys who are investing. Janine, you're smiling, you start. <laughs> well, I think being so close to the founder journey, I just exited my company a year and a half ago and I am basically still a founder, I mean, I'm a founder of a fund, um, but also just, it's, it's everything from the emotional support and text message chats with all of our portfolio companies um, and talking to them through, you know, co-founder uh, breakups and term sheets with other VCs. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, you know, where maybe some male VCs might find that to be, you know, a, more of a, a sympathetic approach, I suppose. But I, I you know, I find that it's, it's working for us to be very close to our founders, um, and we, oh, there's, there's so many things that we help with um, on a daily basis, but I think that, um, what, how about? Yeah, um, so, okay. you know, like I mentioned, we build Renegade to invest in what we call the super critical stage, and what it means is usually companies hit that sort of 20 to 30 people mark, they hit product market fit, and they really think about team, building org processes, having, uh, uh, a recruiting organization, how do you onboard people, train, execute, all those things, people related. So we actually have an operating partner who's a chief people officer that works closely with our companies in all those areas. And you know, founders are asking, doesn't matter if it is male founder, female founder, DNI is one of the things that comes up. How do I recruit diverse talent? How do I think about compensation practices? So as my company evolves, I am not biasing compensation sometimes even unaware of the bias, right? So how am I making sure that I'm resourcing people the right way, I'm putting everyone on the right interesting projects and they're actually having equal opportunity to progress, uh, uh, you know, as my company evolves, how do I recruit diverse board members, diverse cap table? That's something that's very top of mind for founders of all genders. And they know if you don't start early, it just becomes harder and harder and harder, um, mm -hmm. harder to do. Um, another one is compensation and benefits, right? It's something that attraction, retention of talent, and it evolves as a company scales. Gender plays, plays a role, interests play a role in that as well. Um, it's all about execution, and execution comes out of people. Yeah. What about you, Maya? What, what do we provide? Um, we provide capital. We give every company that is accepted at a Techstars program anywhere in the world. Uh, and this year, we're gonna run 60 program we'll get $120,000. Uh, we provide programs. The, the most known is the accelerator program. Um, we joke that this is a three month boot camp on steroids and if you're a founder and, and get through that program, by the end of the program, you're probably gonna need some, some time off to just recover from it. 
Uh, we also provide post-program support, uh, whether it's connection with, uh, with investors, whether it's connection with talent that you want to recruit, uh, or support from, we have a lot of corporate partners. Uh, we work with a lot of big, well-known companies, um, and they're very eager to help the new generation of entrepreneurs and become their clients, potentially acquire them, and so we provide a lot of that. And then the last piece that we do is we provide the network, the Texters network, which is uh, incredibly international. Um, you have 6,600 uh, 6, active mentors from all around the world. Like, you decide that you want your company to open shop in Indonesia, guess what, we have mentors there. You decide that you want to work in uh, a new type of um, food for animals, guess what, we probably have a few dozen companies that have worked on that before and we're going to connect you with it. And these people are going to give you some real life uh, advices. Because what really, really matters when you're an entrepreneur is real life experience from people who've been there before, who've made all these mistakes so that you're not going to make them again. And some of this advice, you may not always like it. Uh, but they are real, and so that's what's going to help you make a difference uh, in the future. So we have just... Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> We have just a few minutes left, and I'm going to go out on a limb and bet that there are a few founders of tomorrow sitting in our audience. So I'm going to go down the line, starting with you, Mayel, and ask for you know just something you'd like them to take away from this conversation. If you're VC or you have money, really, really, really force yourself to check your unconscious bias at the door and really look with a different framework at, at uh, founders that come to you. And if they sound weird and different, spend more time to figure out what, uh, what makes them different and whether it's actually a strength uh, more than a weakness. And if you are an entrepreneur, um, I'm gonna give a very timely advice. Time are going to be tough. We are at the beginning of, of a recession. Fundraising is gonna be difficult. Uh, and surround yourself by people who are going to be able to help you, support you, starting with uh, your team, but also your board if you have one, or anybody around you that can be there to be a sounding board, um, because we are about to enter very likely one of the most dramatic crises that tech has ever seen. Janine, what would you add? Yeah, so I'd say if you're a founder, I, I think what you need to do is um, don't, don't take no's as a, a discouragement. Um, don't you know, take a no personally if you're pitching. Um, I, I, someone told me this uh, little trick and I love it. You just have a jar and it's like your no jar. And every time you get a no from an investor, just plop one of the marbles in a jar and you're, you're whole goal is to fill up the jar. Make sure that you get as many no's as possible so that you're getting closer to your yeses. Renata. Yeah. Those are all fantastic good advice. And I think when you're going against all odds and you're building something against all odds, having conversations of people pointing to you, this is going to be hard is actually not helpful. So actually ask, what do you see here that's interesting? What here is differentiated? What should I be doubling down on? Because as you execute, you're just going to increase your probabilities of succeeding. So have yes conversations instead of engaging on the, like, the why is it's not going to work or why this is risky, because this is inherently risky and most companies fail. So actually try to find out what is interesting. What would you like to see that would make you want to believe? Have yes conversations. Well, thank you all so much and thank you and on to the next one. Thank you.